You're listening to Secrets for Scaling, a Gecko Board podcast that explores the growth secrets of successful founders and CEOs. If you've been enjoying Secrets for Scaling, we ask that you head on over to iTunes to give us a rating or review. That way, people just like you will also discover the founder stories that we've been sharing. Thank you. For this episode, we spoke with Tyler Barstow, co-founder of Vinyl Me Please, a vinyl subscription club. Hey, Tyler. Welcome <laughs> to Secrets for Scaling. Shannon, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I am good. I am barefoot in our office as usual. Um, I am finishing one of these like bulletproof coffee things. Have you had bulletproof coffee before? I did it once like years ago when it first came out. Like I was working in an office at the time and everyone, we decided to try it out, but I have not done it since. Do you feel like it works? Ah, uh, man. Yeah. I mean, I guess so. I mean, I guess the thing is, is it's, it's, it, it's like a lot of health things. I think for me where I used to drink it a lot at a different time in my life when I was a lot less healthy and I didn't notice anything, but that's because when you're eating four pizzas a week and drinking way too much and not sleeping that like nothing, it, it's not like, Oh, the silver bullet that helped me like get back in shape was bulletproof coffee. Like the first step was <laughs> don't drink a lot and don't eat four pizzas a week and get regular sleep, right? Like those are sort of like the low hanging fruit of health for me. So I've been going back to it a little bit now. There's a shop on our street uh, that sells it. So it's like I can buy it at the at the office sometimes. And and I like it. I mean, I guess I feel fine from it. I, I don't know what it's supposed to be accomplishing. Um, so I don't know. I guess it's like, yeah, I, I guess I think it works. But I don't know totally what it's supposed to be doing. I just know that I enjoy drinking it and feel good when I do. So that's that's it. That's like the least scientific defense of bulletproof coffee probably ever. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Is it supposed to like make the energy last longer from one cup or something? I haven't really, I don't know what it's supposed to do either. I don't know. I think it's supposed to like jumpstart your system somehow in a way that a regular cup of coffee doesn't. It's got like some oils in it and some other stuff. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I live at near Boulder. I lived in Boulder for a while and now I live near it. And it's like the epicenter for really healthy people getting into things that are going to make them like even healthier. It's weird, right? Because it's like, let's assume that you were, I don't know, 70% healthy. Like you have a lot of room to grow, right? Like changing your diet has a huge impact on you. And like, you know, going for a run every day has a huge impact on you. But Boulder has a ton of people who are probably like 97% healthy. And they're like obsessed with getting to 98 you know, like, or 99, which is just like a level of health that I'm not interested in. Like just on a core level, I just don't care about it. Like my wife does, which is great. I'm not like making fun of those people. It's just a weird environment to interact with diets and stuff, because for a lot of it, I feel like it's this thing where people are constantly tweaking something to try and get an extra percent or half percent out of their diet on some sort of health scale zero to a hundred. And there, I, it, it would be hard, difficult for me to describe a process or a mindset that I identify with less. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, that's not really totally related to bulletproof coffee, but I think it's like probably one of those things that's like, oh man, do you climb five days a week and you eat and you're like a vegetarian or something and you spend 400 bucks on groceries every week. Then the next thing that you can do is drink bulletproof coffee and that will make you feel a little bit better. There's like Tim Ferriss will probably want to hit me with an axe for saying that. I'm probably wrong about that. That's just my impression of it. So I like how you're like skipping a step there. You're like, screw the going climbing four times a day. I'm gonna drink some bulletproof coffee. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just like I'm not climbing. No one's ever looked at me in person and been like, uh, you know, what that guy needs to do. He needs to go climbing. Like, yeah. <laughs> I need to be. I need to be as close to the ground as possible at all times. So. <laughs> So yeah, so for me, it's things like Bulletproof Coffee. Anyway, that was a long answer to your question, but that's how I'm doing. Nice, good. Glad to hear it. (laughs) All right, well, diving in. For anyone who's not familiar with Final Me Please, can you tell us a little bit about what it is, who your customers are, and what your business model is? So Final Me Please is a record subscription. It's a record of the month club. Uh, It's a subscription service. Every month we work with a a band or an artist to do a special edition pressing of one of their albums. We do that because we we basically, our criteria is we go around finding records that we believe are worth sitting down with. There's something really meaningful and important about sitting down and listening to that record from beginning to end. Usually many times uh, we feel like that that album 
in particular, and that artist has something really important to say there that we think uh, you need to hear, and you need to hear the way that it was intended to be heard in like an, a full album format. So we do a special edition pressing of their album, as that implies that pressing has never been done before. Sometimes it's on a different weight of vinyl. Sometimes, usually, it's a different color variant of the vinyl. Sometimes the vinyl has never, it's never, sometimes that record has never been on vinyl or has it never been repressed or something like that. So we go, we do a project like that. We, we send the music to a visual artist that we really like, have them do like a 12 by 12 art print that's inspired by that r- music or that record in particular. And then we have somebody in the world of, I guess, liquor or alcohol who, <laughs> To, to listen to the record and pair it with a cocktail recipe. So every month you get a, a box that has a copy of the special edition pressing, a copy of the art print, and a co- copy of the cocktail rep- recipe. Everybody in the club gets a copy of the same record every month. And then we have a store where you can shop for 20 to 30 other records a month. Some of them we also do special pressings of at lower numbers, lower quantities. Uh, you can buy those there. And then there's other just normal records. You can just add your shipment. Uh, the shipping is free and uh, the pricing is always a little bit below Amazon. So in a nutshell, it's that. It's a record subscription with some cool add-ons. As someone who has been a subscriber, I can vouch for how lovely the experience is and the branding on the product. It's thank um, you. always like a special treat to get them in the mail. Well, the branding, I mean, thank you for saying that. I don't know. Matt sort of came up with the branding, the original branding that we had. And I came up with a voice for it. And then like last year, we got a rebrand done with these amazing people in Berlin named A Color Bright. So they really did. Find Me Please as you interact with it now is in some ways, just like it has always been in other ways, has been significantly upgraded, I think. And A Color Bright did an incredible job. So I would love to take credit for, for what you just said, but I don't feel like I really can. I think I need to turn that into a very brief commercial for A Color Bright because they're amazing And they sort of came in and figured out how to move us into a place where like some of the things that we stand for are communicated in much clearer ways, I think. And for the audience, that's your co-founder, right? Oh, yeah, Matt. Yeah. So how big is the team now? There are 15 of us, which is insane. 15 people are on payroll. We pay 15 people every month and they live with that money and stuff like they I don't know. You know what I mean? It's weird. That's weird. Yeah. I'm sure it's surreal to like think back to that time in Chicago when you guys were just working on it nights and weekends and now you're actually paying people. <laughs> yeah, I mean like we were such dumbasses. Like we I mean, maybe not, sort of. We didn't know what we were doing and so we used to throw these parties, these like record parties, and we would charge people ten bucks a head to it was all the like beer you could drink and all the cake you could eat. And we'd like go to a bar, like a nice bar in Chicago, and we'd have these listening parties. And like we would make a thousand bucks or something. And like that's how we made money for like seven or eight months. Like we had, we, you know, we never had a, we, I don't think we ever had a, a month where during that first year where like we had fewer customers at the end of it than we did at the beginning of it. But it would be like Matt and I would go to a, like one of those like hipster market things where you go at the table and stand there. April Francis from Chicago was super, actually super nice to us and got us into her dose market thing a few times. And so we'd like go to one of those things and we'd get like seven customers. And so we'd go from like 23 customers to 30 customers and be like, yeah. And then we'd throw a party and, and we were running at cost. Like we weren't making any money from our subscription because we didn't we had just put money from our credit cards in. And so we were just using the money from each month that we made to pay for growth for the next month. We would just throw these parties and that's like how we floated the the business. We'd bring in over three months, we'd have an extra like 2,500 bucks from three parties. And then we'd like use that to grow a little, try and grow a little bit faster or something. You know what I mean? But growing faster was like, let's try and get 40 customers instead of 30 this month or something. I mean, it was so small and weird. So at what point, were you seeing enough revenue from actual subscriptions rather than the parties to be able to stop doing the parties so much and start focusing on the actual product? Oh, man. Well, we had always thought a lot about the product. I mean, I, from the very beginning, like we were writing handwritten notes to every customer. So we, we were so dumb. Well, our heart was in the right place. We just didn't know how the fuck to run a company. Like we went, I remember like, we knew from the beginning that we wanted it to be awesome. We wanted to feel like a birthday present that you got, right? So like, I remember we went to this craft paper store in Chicago, lived in River North and it was like right by our apartment and uh, we would buy these big rolls of like like the kind of paper that feels important or something. I don't know how to describe it. I'm not into that thing. It just felt cool to touch the paper or something. Anyway, so we went and got these huge rolls of these, this black paper and we would wrap everything in black paper and then wrap that together with twine 
And then I, we would, Matt and I would hand write notes to all of our customers. And then we were doing this thing with playlists where we got a few volunteers and every month we would call each of our customers on the phone and talk to them. We had these like profiles of notes for each of these people and we'd like call them and we would uh, talk to them about music and then make them a playlist every month and stuff, right? Like we wanted to be like, at every point in the product, we wanted people to feel like they put a ton of thought into this. Even if it's clearly like three people in an apartment doing this by hand, we wanted it to feel really special for people. And so anyway, we actually, the weirdest part for us was where we hit a point where we were too big to do that anymore, but not big enough to like make it sweeter than that. If that makes sense. Like, I feel like for a while, our product actually like was downgraded, I think, because like we had to basically mass assemble stuff. There wasn't nearly as much like personal touch in each package. And that was a really frustrating time. So anyway, I mean, we had to switch to these like nondescript brown mailers and we couldn't hand sign everything because like there's a few thousand of them or something. You just don't have time anymore because everything else is happening. And you're just literally like starting to wrap next month's records as soon as you finish last month's. And but all that to say, I guess like there wasn't so much a time where it was like, we need to put more thought. We, now we can finally put more thought into the product. I think the frustrating time was there was times where like we didn't have the money or the time to like sustain the quality of the product as we grew. And we had to figure other stuff out to try and like cover for that, if that makes sense. I imagine that being frustrating, but you know my theory on this. I feel like... Sometimes the best companies start out doing things really manual and it builds that loyalty, right? It builds that yeah. initial community and buzz. And, um, and of course, you have to you have to learn how to scale. And I think your best customers are going to understand the product's going to change if they want it to survive. Yeah, it's just like a thing where you, I don't know, it's weird. I think, yeah, it, one of the things that helped us a lot was we made, we wanted Vinyl Me Please to feel like a family and like a community. And it wasn't just like a record coming in the mail. It was a thing like a, in a like a, this member you were a member of like a, a for real club where all over the u.s there were these other people that love music just as you did and the people building the product love music just as you did which was all true but yeah it's weird i mean in that environment as well one of the one of the weird things is like you balance that with the fact that on some level like your early adopters are not the people necessarily that were always who are always going to be like the, also the biggest part of the market that's going like of your of your future member base like not everyone that down the road is going to be like them and it, it was a weird process of like we don't want to do anything to like betray the people who have been with us for a long time but we also want you know that there are ways that we have to grow up you know what i mean and and it, it's not just a family of 40 people or 100 people anymore right and so that was like a and that was good. We just sort of like talked a lot with our customers. We emailed them a lot. We were very open with them when things went wrong. I remember one time we had a December where like the a label was going to be 10 weeks late on this shipment. And so there was going to be no record for Christmas. I think it was our first Christmas or something. And it was just like there was nothing we could do about it. And so we just wrote them a long note and was like, this is all the stuff that happened. This is how, you know, and so we lost a few people, but we didn't go under like a lot of people stuck with, through that with us. And so I think like communication even is one of those parts of your product that help you when things hit the fan, because they always do just being very open and honest with people like you would with people you care about, because you should care about your, your customers that much. And just being honest with them and being like, Hey, we messed up and we're going to fix it this way. Or, Hey, it, you know, there's nothing we could do. And here's how we're going to like make this right with you guys. We're not really to blame for this, but we're not even blaming anyone else. It's just a really crappy thing that happened and we're going to do our best to still make your life awesome in December, even though we can't send you a record, because if we sent you a different record, we'd run out of money and then Bonnie Me Please would die. So, you know what I mean? So anyway, yeah, I mean. Totally. I Yeah, I went to a festival one time that ended up being canceled and their lack of communication around it was just like, come on, man, like this yeah. could, would be totally fine. Everyone understands that things happen. I don't think you can communicate too much or too honestly yeah. in situations like that. Totally. So with 15 people, what approach do you guys take to the collaboration hierarchy? How is the team structured? Yes, yeah, basically we have people who are like owners for what, like certain parts of the business, right? So like Cameron is head of music and like Matt Hessler is the head of marketing. So those are a couple examples where there's like some basically sections of the business that just are ongoing things, I guess, like admin things that just, they do the higher level work there. Cam d handles all of the monthly features that we do. And Alex works with him on those things. So Alex is like the, kind of like the assistant music director. She's not the assistant to Cameron. She's just, she handles, she oversees a ton of stuff in music. And then Cameron is sort of like, he orchestrates a lot of the projects and stuff. There's a hierarchy in that sense, 
But I think a lot of the ways that internally that we break down is that people have ownership of certain things that are going on or that need to be done. And then every two weeks, the whole team gets together and we talk about progress that's being made in those different areas. We do that primarily because collaboration is something that we rely a lot on. We give people a lot of freedom to work, a lot of freedom to like run with with things that they're responsible for, things that, that they that they want to do. And we've had problems with that at times. We've had to tighten things up a bit because I think sometimes I think if you don't manage that process at all, then I think sometimes you end up with different parties in the company having totally different visions for where the company is going or where they want it to go. And so we've tightened up some of that side of it of like, here's what we're trying to accomplish. And, get, and we're all sort of on the same page with that. But from there, you know, we try to give people a lot of freedom to one, pursue things and make mistakes as they're doing that. And also to collaborate with each other. So on one level, we're very structured. And on another level, we're very flat. I'd like to unpack that a bit, starting with how have you learned to tactically share that vision? What do you do to ensure that everyone knows that vision and is aligned around the same one? Yeah, no, that's a great, man, that's a great question. So there's this idea, I actually, I was just listening to a podcast today, the guy, I think his name's Scott Belsky, he talked about basically merchandising progress, right? That So Matt is a like functioning CEO of the company. And so I think a lot of his job as had, over the last year, especially, has grown into basically communicating very clearly on a day-to-day and week-to-week basis. Here's where we're going. Here are the goals that we're going towards. Here's our progress. Here's how we're like basically trending on each of those things. And, uh, and then working to like encourage the areas of the business that maybe aren't moving as fast as we would like and to like celebrate the ones that are and to like basically help us help each other, if that makes sense. So I think on some level there is, this idea. So, I mean, for us, it was like, we want to help people form deeper connections to music and artists that matter. Right. And so that started with, there's like a lot of things related to our product there. There's a lot of things related to our content. There's a lot of things related to our vision and where we're headed. And so I think we've condensed those things down into what could be, I guess, called like a a pretty practical timeline of how we are accomplishing that for us is getting people into alignment of, okay, so what is the best music club on earth? Like, what does that subscription look like? And what is the, our like customer support look like? What does our content look like? What does our marketing look like? Those sorts of things. And so we, out of those conversations and meetings come very practical things. And those end up being goals for the year or the quarter or whatever. And then I think arranging those into something where people are both accountable to accomplish them and also free to learn and reach and like shift direction based on what we're learning along the way. It's like a little bit like herding cats on some level, but I think it's it's getting people on board with, hey, we all are trying to build this one thing. This we're, we've built, we know what we've built up to this point, right? And we're trying here, what we're doing is trying to take this from point A to point B, where point B being like, not so much the ideal version in an, in an abstract way, but what we know Vinyl Me Please can become. And we've outlined that in very practical terms. Um, I think that uh, it's easy to become overly abstract about things and to feel like progress is happening when it isn't. And that's one of the interesting things about business is that, like, I think it's easy to watch movies about business or listen to speeches about business and think like, oh, man, this is like this sort of emotional response of like possible grandeur for yourself and your company that can that may one day inevitably happen uh, as long as you continue to show up sort of thing. And on some level, that is true. Like showing, continuing to show up and work hard is important. But I think b- becoming more and more intelligent about the product that you're trying to build, the company you're trying to build, and and getting that down into the practical world, like the day-to-day world is, I think, the really essential point. I, I remember my daddy used to work for this British company. His boss would always tell him that, like, if you can't explain something in writing in a sentence or two or a par- like a short paragraph, you you probably don't understand it. Right. Like if you can't write it out so that someone else understands it, you don't understand it well. And I think it's that applies in business as well. I think it's like if you can't put actionable steps towards what you're trying to accomplish as a business, then what you're trying to accomplish as a business either is never going to happen or isn't possible. It just right. isn't it's not going a to business. Happen. Yeah, it's not business. At that point, it's a thought experiment that you're doing on someone's dime. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and like, if you start your own business, you don't really have time for that. Like you need to be doing things that make your money and grow your company. And it's like, it's cool that everybody likes Apple or Steve Jobs or whatever. But the fact is, the fact of the matter is, is that like Apple sold computers, they made computers that were like simpler and cheaper to, to do, 
or whatever. Like that's what they got started doing was they were making just personal computers and they had their own differentiations in the market and they just sold a bunch of them, right? I mean, there was like a very practical nature to it. It wasn't like Steve Jobs wasn't standing necessarily running around every day being like some sort of philosophical Robin Hood trying to rally everybody that they were going to be the next thing, self-made thing without also being like, we have fucking deadlines and what is our product and how are we getting there? And so I think like, I don't even really like Steve Jobs, so I don't know why I reference him. But my point is, is that like, I think to your question, I think the way that we do that is we try to go as quickly from the abstract to the practical as we possibly can, and then create timelines and structure around those practical things so that we can say, was this a good idea or not? And actually know and see like, what did the, what returns is this idea getting us? Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Whenever it gets talked about SpaceX's mission to metrics approach, I think in your case, your mission is to be the best damn record club out there. And then each team member understands what they're doing to help get the company there. Is that right? Yeah. Like, because you're not really supporting anyone in the company. If you're like, you need to do this thing, your job depends on it. But actually, we're not totally sure how to measure that thing. And uh, we'll just sort of decide at the time, at the end of the quarter, what how we feel about what you're doing. Right? <laughs> like. That's not a way to manage people. I think like giving people setting expectations that are that will push them, but aren't unreasonable in the sense that I think it's good to create big goals like, hey, we want to strive for this thing, but giving them digestible takeaways from that conversation. So it's like, oh, okay. so what I really need to do is I'm actually trying to grow the number of emails on this list or I'm trying to grow the number of subscribers to this thing or or I'm trying to make our product look better or like more better to open, or I'm trying to add on things to this subscription that will improve the value of our membership to people and things like that. Or it's much simpler to talk to somebody about than like, we're going to be the best music club ever. Like, I hope so. I think we are now, but I, we, we're not anywhere close to where we're going to be, but I hope we get there. Right. Like, I, I hope we do. I think we will, but I, and, and that's not really helpful to be like, okay, everybody go make us the best music club ever every week or something, right? Like that's not, that doesn't mean anything. You also talked about giving your team a lot of autonomy and letting them make their own mistakes. How do you help them communicate those mistakes and the lessons they learned in the process? And how do you set goals around them? I think one of the biggest things is like a good way to let people communicate is to not be a jackass to people when they communicate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, it's weird, right? It's like if you're like a, a friend with someone and every time you talk to them, it's like, they get they get all on your case or whatever. You're just going to stop talking to them, right? Like you're just going to stop telling them everything or telling them things that you know that they're going to be upset about. And I think that's like even worse sometimes in a company because it's like you've got people who are trying really hard because they want to have a job and because they like your company that you started and they want to be a part of it. And you have a, a lot of environments sometimes I think where it's like, we want you to be super open and creative and thoughtful and do all these things, which is literally just saying, like, we want you to be operating like in the like the top percentile of yourself to help grow this company. But then also being like, at the same time, we're going to be jackasses when you mess up. Even if we say that we're not being jackasses, we're going to be jackasses. Right. So it's like, well, you know, what? Uh, like always, always, always critiquing, for instance, or always telling them an idea that's better than theirs instead of testing their ideas or like just listening and not saying a lot. Right. And being like, OK, like one thing for me personally that I think that I've tried to do is if I'm talking to someone about marketing, I don't know a lot about marketing, but they do. So I try to ask questions. Right. Instead of giving them all my thoughts on how their marketing can be better, because I'm not really sure. And t I tend to assume now I didn't assume this even a year ago. I tend to assume now that. I don't know as I don't know nearly as much about the thing we're talking about as a person who's doing it every day, which is so obvious. But I think sometimes when people start companies, they part of their like need to control something is like their need to have input on everything and to provide direction on everything in a way that's like really just micromanaging and kind of controlling, which just bums people out. I mean, I don't even know how else to say that. Like, I don't Obviously, that's not like what a Stanford grad would tell, like a Stanford business school grad would call it or something. But I think sometimes people are like entrepreneurs in general are just bad at not bumming their employees out. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a matter of them letting the stress overwhelm them and letting that therefore impact the team and how they communicate with the team. Yeah. Well, it's like ultimately it's rare that the person on your team is the person who is causing your anxiety. Oh, What's yeah. probably causing your anxiety is that like now you have like a young family and you're trying to pay for their stuff 
or pay for their life or whatever off of what this company does. And so like, you're probably coming into work being like, oh God, like we have these loans, you know, we got to make this amount of money. We got these like loans. We've got these, like all these members that we care about. We want them all to be happy. And then I've got like, I go home and I'm like, I got to keep paying for this stuff or whatever. And then if someone messes something up on a marketing thing, ultimately most of the time, it's not always true, but most of the time it's not a big deal. Most of the time, nothing's going to go away forever. But I think a lot of times like it's, you, f- you react that way because of all this in- stress in your head. And that person is not contributing, is not causing that stress. You're just taking it out on them because it's the most justifiable one, right? Like, and it feels cool to be like, I'm a perfectionist. I'm going to freak out on this person. Then I'm going to be a little bit more like my favorite CEO or whatever, right? That I saw in a movie. But like, that's not helping anybody. That's not making your company better. It's making it way worse. Because the next time that person's going to try and hide the fact that they made a mistake, And then it's going to compound and compound and compound and you won't even know about it. Why? Because you blew up and like threw your barbecue sandwich across the room or something stupid, right? I've never done that. But I just mean like you're going to do something stupid and that and then they're just over time, they're just not going to trust you. And does that answer your question at all? It does. And it leads to another question. Do you think there's any way for founders to prevent those explosions from happening or like prevent being a bad leader from day one? I think a lot of it comes down to stress management, right? So I guess my question is, do you have any advice or tips on how to best manage that stress as a founder? That's a good question, man. There are a lot of like pretty much there are so many people alive who are more qualified to answer that than me. I would say that... uh, Managing stress. Hmm. Okay. I would say that most of this is stuff that I just learned from other people who are much further down the road than me, but that has helped. I think one thing to keep in mind is that business is is fundamentally a human enterprise. I think one of the things that's annoying to me a lot about like the quest for perfectionism is that perfection is not a human quality and it's not ever going to be. And I think that the sooner you adjust to the fact that you are going to make mistakes, the people you're working with are going to make mistakes, people are going, the people that you are serving every day, whether they're your, call them customers or members or whatever, the people whose lives you kind of exist to try and make better through your product or your service, they're going to make mistakes. You are engaged, you are hitting up again the humanity of business again and again and again and again. And I think entrepreneurs on some level or anyone who works in business, not so much need to go for perfectionism to the, and as much as I think they need to go for much more of like a Zen. I, I mean, uh, we could get into a lot around this. We won't. Obviously, stoicism is like the hot topic now in the business world. I'm reading Ryan Holiday's stoic devotional thing as well as Ego is the Enemy. The quest for perfectionism, I think, ends up being much more of one of like an ongoing war with yourself and the way that you view yourself in the world and the way that you interact, view yourself in the context of other people than it is a business term in a strict scientific sense. A business will never be perfect. Uh, the, The people you work with will never be perfect. But I think your ability to get to a place where you stop projecting your own problems on the people you work with and on your product and on your customers is as close to perfection as you're going to get. And so I think from that standpoint, I would say that a lot of the work of being an entrepreneur or ends up being work that you're doing on yourself. I think owning, starting a business, owning a business, running it, growing it, et cetera, et cetera, reveals a lot in you that is not good, that's immature, that is behind, that is um, not up to snuff. And I think a balance of therapy, to be honest, there's just a shit ton of stress. And it makes sense. You're trying to create something from nothing and then live off of it. Like, that's a scary thing. And you've, you're getting tons of input from all over the place of people who love it and people who hate you because you made this thing. Not even just like, they're cool with you, it's like they would like they want to beat the shit out of you for making it for some reason on, you know, Reddit or something. I don't know. That stuff takes a toll on you. No, so I guess I would say go to therapy. I would also say, like, find resources that are helping you confront yourself in a, in a mature and constructive way. Whatever that is, like a mentor. I have a couple mentors. Maybe it's books like Ryan Holiday's book, something similar. Uh, but something where, like, you are being realistic with yourself. I think as much as being an entrepreneur is very hard, I think there's also a huge trap for entrepreneurs to be extremely self-sympathizing. Where, like, you hang out with other entrepreneurs entrepreneurs and all you talk about is how hard it is and everybody's like nobody gets me it's like well I don't know nobody gets you probably because you don't let people into your life like I'm bad at that I clam up all the time 
I'm married now, so it's like a lot more obvious. Like my wife talks to me about that four times a week, probably. But it's like you, it becomes this very self-serious, like self-sympathizing thing where you feel like, I don't know, like you feel like you're like fucking Moses or something going up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments or something. And it's like, dude, you just ha- have a company that does a thing. And like, there's a lot of stress, but a lot of other people in your life have stress too. And, and you can just talk to them and be friends with them and not take yourself so like heroically or something, if that makes sense. So I think I, to that extent, I think Ryan Holiday's book, Ego is the Enemy, is so profoundly good. I think the, tr- the, the title is literally true. I think getting rid of your ego is so important just to be a healthy person. So I would say stuff like that. Some of the luck of being a first-time entrepreneur, I think, is maybe being successful despite yourself <laughs> rather than because of yourself. And I think the people who are successful long-term end up being people who start getting rid of their ego, who start taking care of their body, who start finding healthy ways to deal with their stress, who start opening themselves up to people rather than continuing to wall themselves off more and more and more. I, Dude, I'm 29. This is my first startup. I, that's all advice that I've gotten from people who are older than me that has continued to hold true as I have embarked on many of those own my own journeys around those topics over the last year to year and a half. Um, and those are the things that like, I'm happy to point people to people who have come up with those things. I haven't come up with any of that. I have just been applying them and found them to be true. So that's all I can really say. Man. Yeah. That's great. And it's also a great place for us to wrap up at. Thanks so much for joining us, Tyler. Thank you for having me. This has been great. Thank you for listening to Gecko Board's Secrets for Scaling podcast. If you know someone who you think would be a great guest for Secrets for Scaling, or if you want to share your own scaling story, email me anytime at shannon at geckoboard.com. We'd love to have you. If you've been enjoying Secrets for Scaling, please consider giving us a review on iTunes. We'd appreciate it.